you'd be surprised how much pressure is on you sometimes in this job and not to have that you don't realize when until you leave so that's what they tell me don't mind I would continue just a little bit if I can yeah I know no 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 carry on Karen just kidding then I leave you to play golf I, okay. I promise um, okay. because I, we, we know about the, the the contract situation of the riders it's, it's every time it's a huge talk topic whatever but what about uh, with you guys with the mechanics how is your contract things going yeah so you might have read some out some things about about us normally a mechanic is not even mentioned anywhere but because i worked for valentino for such a long time the group around him uh, becomes a news story also sometimes so uh, at the moment because valentino has not signed his contract uh, the next people after that are the mechanics so there is some at the moment i my contract uh is normally year to year anyway the last few last year was a two-year contract and so it finishes at the end of this year with Yamaha so at the moment um, I don't have something for next year but we will see so it's just it's racing is like this I remember when I started uh, 28 years ago my mother said to me what are you going to do next year and I said I don't know that was 28 years ago so yeah you never know in racing what happens. So I don't know sure. At the, at the moment, sorry? Is she continue asking this? Uh, no, no. Uh, no. Normally she asks about my health now and I'm worried about her. You know, normally, are you feeling okay? You okay? That's like mothers, that's what they do. But no, she doesn't worry about me from a job point of view anymore. So I don't know what I'll do next year yet. Uh, racing has been my life, so probably can keep racing I don't know who knows if but at the moment I, I, I'm, I'm going to be a free agent next year so we'll see but when Valentino signs then normally people start to talk if you you won't be able to follow Valentino because as you also said it's really uncertain can you imagine to to stay in the paddock uh, not working for him or with him um, it's hard, it's hard to imagine now because I've spent so long. If if you asked me ten years ago or fifteen years ago, yeah, you know, no problem. But when you've been with, also, I'm fifty one. I've been in the paddock a long time now. Uh, I'm closer to the end than the beginning. So uh, where the end is, I'm not sure. It could it could be this year, it could be next year, it could be the year after. But I'm sure it's coming closer. But I think you went through already some similar a couple of years ago when JB left the paddock. Yeah, yeah, it's always it's always what well, feels very sad at the time because it's a strange job you're in. It's a strange business. But uh, every time I talk to JB, I talk to he sends a lot of text messages, which is surprising for JB. Uh, but you get to talk to him sometimes, and he still very much follows the racing and is interested in the settings of the bike still um, but he's very happy and so is Gary who was a guy that used to do the pit board and fuel very very happy guys and uh, I think they like you'd be surprised how much pressure is on you sometimes in this job and not to have that you don't realize when until you leave so that's what they tell me uh, do, do you see each other uh, when you uh, are in Australia or maybe you all anyway uh, live far away I haven't seen JB, oh yes, one time since since he retired, per, face to face. Uh, he lives quite a long way away, like uh, uh, 20 hours or so drive. So it's a long way. Uh, Gary lives about 10 hours away. I've seen him one time too. Just he travels with a caravan around Australia, sometimes stops to say hello, have a cup of tea and go on somewhere else. But the, the last year I haven't seen either of the guys. But uh, Gary is still on our uh, team WhatsApp group, so uh, he sees all our messages when we say we're going to. Uh, nobody's deleted him, so every time we go to dinner, hey, we meet in the bar at eight o'clock, blah blah blah. 
yeah, Gaza still sees all that. So it's kind of nice. That's nice. That's touching. Um, we know the story and everyone uh, who doesn't know the story, just go to to Alex's uh, website and and have a look and read it. I was wondering that how JB, Jeremy Burgess for everyone, uh, knew about you that time because you got a phone, that famous phone call, let's say, but uh, oh. He was already in the road racing. You were in motocross. How did, I was wondering that. How did he know about you? So one of the mechanics that worked for Mick Doohan was named Peter Laskowski. His nickname was Buddha. And uh, he, Jerry, they were making a new team for Daryl Beatty. And so the first people that JB asked is the mechanics that he's working for. Do you guys know anyone that would be good? Because obviously, if you're already a mechanic, you know what it's like. And I had talked to Peter because we had friends in the Australian Grand Prix uh, the year before, and I was working for an Australian motocross champion at the time. And I had just signed a deal to go to Europe to work for, uh, from, in motocross for a, a Belgian rider, Marnik Bevertz. I think it was Belgian. Anyway, it's a very small world. And so he knew I wanted to go to Europe to work. I, I, that's what I wanted to do. And he suggested my name to JB. JB called me. I had already agreed to go to motocross in Europe. So I rang that guy and said, what do you think? I, I agreed with you and I shook your hand. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do both, but what do you think? And uh, the guy was an, another Australian, Gary Bennett. And he said, ah, co-road racing, it's cleaner. So, uh, so yeah, so it was a connection between uh, Buddha and JB. And Buddha used to be in motocross in Australia. So it was all like this. And he suggested me to Jerry. And then I remember saying to Jerry, I got the job just like that. And Jerry said, I can fire you tomorrow. Don't worry. <laughs> nice. Why did you want to come to Europe this much? Because that was one of your dreams, let's say. Yeah, when I was a, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a motocross superstar. You know, that's what I thought. And, uh, and so I knew all of Europe and I knew I knew it was a big deal. So I just wanted to, I wanted to be better at, at being a mechanic. So I, the place to go was either America or Europe, you know, and I had the opportunity to go to Europe. So that's why I just wanted to go. Yeah. But back, back in that time, uh, did you follow, uh, not MotoGP because that time it was uh, the road racing world championship, or did you have any idea about the guys like Ben oh, Gardner? Yeah. No, not really. I mean, I'd watched a few races and I'd been to Eastern Creek and watched a race. I took took my camera gear and I got passes and went on the infield, but it wasn't something I followed. I followed motocross. I was a motocross fan. For you, what is the toughest thing to working in, in, in MotoGP and following the whole circus? Toughest thing? I'm not sure. I, I I don't find it that difficult. Sometimes I find just the you have to, the concentration you have to have can be tiring on the job, you know, because sometimes you're doing things that you've done a thousand times and trying not to make a mistake doing something that you do a thousand times. It sounds easy, but it's not easy because you can't remember if the the vision in your head was you doing the bolt up yesterday the day before the temp you know it's like so it's quite hard diff difficult sometimes to keep the concentration when you're doing the simple repetitive task that's probably the hardest thing i i enjoy the travel i enjoy everything about it i may be checking in checking out that is a pain in the ass every day checking in checking out of hotels of airlines of everything like that 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 probably is the worst part i mean and that's a first world problem i'm lucky do you watch back the races? Normally no. no. Because you I, are not interested? I think if you if you get too interested, you actually you become a fanatic. And I don't think you're very clear on uh, what you want to do. If you some people are consumed by it and don't see anything else and I don't think they make very good decisions because they don't see enough other things mm -hmm. so I think sometimes the best decisions and ideas come from other sports other businesses other you, you if you just focus only on on 
the sport itself, I think you miss opportunities. So you need to look at lots of things. Sometimes I watch parts of races that I, there was a problem or something. It's very, very difficult to tell from watching a race, the bike set up or something like that. Very difficult. You can, you can, you have an idea, you know, you can see that they might struggle braking compared to somebody else, but it's difficult. Like when you're on the side of the track and you watch a bike, some people come in and say, uh, it's doing this or it's doing that. It's because of this. It's not as easy as that. So yeah, I, I enjoy watching the races, but I don't, um, I'm not a fanatic. If you know, I watch them on Sunday, like you can't believe. Help Mark with the pit board. And you, you focus on your rider and you focus on the guy behind, the guy in front, and you just look at the waiting for the split time to arrive on the screen. You're just like, come on, come on. <gasps> and then, you know, it might try to put the name on the pit board or something. So you, I watch closely like that, but I don't, I don't watch it in my spare time like a, like a madman, you know. When I, I didn't really see the very, the crash because I was on the pit wall helping Mark doing the pit board. So uh, we were just watching the split times more than anything. And then we realized this is a crash, but we didn't at that time realize how close to disaster it was. Um, I kind of saw it on the TV when we were back in the garage, but immediately we were just into the mode of getting, making sure we were ready for the restart, worrying about fuel and tires and it really didn't hit me at all and even that night that night we talked about and watched it it still it was just still more of a regular i don't know i didn't feel anything particularly dif different but the next day after sleeping and seeing it more i it it hit me more the following day i so um yeah at, at the time it, it uh, really didn't um it didn't affect me too much because we just started working, but it wasn't, it was actually the following day after I'd slept on it and watched all the, all the videos online, all the stuff on Twitter, and then it had a bigger effect, obviously the effect that it's had on most people at the time. Have you, have you ever had the chance to uh, watch Valentino riding uh, from the uh, uh, service road or so by the track? Not very, not very often, every now and then, if we do a long run so we might do a in malaysia test or something like that and you can go on the scooter quickly to the back of the circuit and watch say if he's doing 20 laps we'll you know, go and watch five or six or something but normally you have to be in the pits in case something goes wrong you know or you're ready for whatever happens so normally only when riders have been injured have i spent lots of time mm -hmm. so you know when mick was injured or uh Valentino missed a couple of races, but only the one race, and then you get a replacement rider, so you're back in the box. And just before I leave you go, two more questions or topics. How the passion for golf has born? Uh -huh. Well, I love golf. It's crazy. I, um, That's I know, but I never heard how. Uh, I played when I was younger, when, when, when I used to have a lot of time off between racing, I would play as a kid. So I really had that passion then, but then I stopped. And uh, for the last 10 years, I really or more, I've really got addicted again like crazy and I love everything about it. I think I love it because it's kind of the opposite to everything else. It's, uh, it's quiet. Uh, it's on grass, not uh, bitumen, not tarmac. Um, the only mistake is me. If I make a mistake, it's me. I don't let the team down. It's just me. Uh, it's, it's like the opposite. It's quiet and nice. I, I love everything about it. And I really love the mechanical aspect of the angles and the, the technical stuff of the, of the golf clubs, you know. So now I, I do a lot of uh, building of golf clubs, pulling them apart and uh, it's a it's a funny sort of game, but uh, I really enjoy it, and I do a lot of work for my friends for their golf clubs back home. Do you do any other sport, like and also, I mean, uh, at the racetrack because a couple of people are running, others are cycling. 
No, for for me in, in that case, it's 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 golf. I don't. I'm not a gym gym junkie or anything like that. It's golf. But when we get the opportunity to go riding a motocross bike or a trials a bike or something like that, yeah, I, I, I'll do that. I enjoy riding dirt bikes a lot still. Uh, trials, we did in, uh, there was the opportunity to ride a trials bike in Austria between the a, the Austria 1, Austria 2. The, within the circuit, they have all these activities. Um, so we did a trials riding with some of the guys in the team. That was great, great fun. Other guys did some motocross and go-karting. That was all good fun. And lastly, for the Hungarian followers, tell me, please, what was your favorite thing in Budapest, a part of the, the Flipper Museum? <laughs> yeah, well, the, the Pinball Museum was great. I, I really had a great time there when I, when I met you there and I met a, met a fan from Twitter, actually. I don't know if you know the whole story, but as a fan from Twitter had just contacted me and said, uh, hey, you know, you want to, you want contacted me and he doesn't speak uh, English and I don't speak Hungarian and he, he said would you like to come around and do something with me I said yeah okay no problem and he and I call him Salami Man so he'll probably watch this and he'll know who he is right so Salami Man basically he's he's got a business where he drives a truck around uh, Budapest delivering hams and salami and uh and I said, yeah, I'll do that with you. So he picked me up at the hotel. I jumped in his truck and we drove around for the day to all the places with a trolley with all the salamis and we delivered salami to, and, and the whole time we had to use the phone with uh, Google Translate to talk. And still, still we do this. Yeah, he's a nice guy and we, we and he then went to dinner and we, uh, with his friends, and it was great. Uh, so that's a strange thing. And of course, I got to meet you. So the people in Hungary are great. I love the place. I love the view from up on the hill on the other side of the looking down the river. Oh, the, uh, that's a great place. Yeah, I'd love to go back. I hope and I think we all hope that this uh, COVID-19 situation ends really, really soon and we all will be able to, to travel uh, free again. And I hope that you will come back to, to Hungary and to Budapest soon, maybe with your wife and your family. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day and have a nice golf session. I'm going to try. I'm, try. I'm calling it exercise, OK? That's where we're allowed to do exercise. So. OK, have a nice exercise then. Thank you so much again for your time. Good to see you, Nikki. Bye.